So welcome to Shapes of Grief this week. I'm delighted to be joined by Nora Casey. Nora, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me, Liz. So uh, Nora's name is no uh, is, is well known. Nora's name is well known in houses in Ireland. Um, but for those of you who are listening from abroad, uh, Nora is well. If I was to really explain who you are, I think I'd be here an hour later you trying were. to get everything into just a couple of words. But Nora, you, you started your career as a nurse. Um, you're an entrepreneur, very, very successful entrepreneur, broadcaster, publisher. You're a wife. You're a, a mother. And from what I've seen of you in recent months since I got to know you, having met you last year, is you're a, an advocate for change. Um, uh, an advocate for women's rights and for human rights, um, as well as running several businesses. I, I see you there on Instagram in your beanie and your sleeping bag, sleeping out um, in your garden, I assume, because of the pandemic for Focus Ireland. You're pointing out the window. Yes. Where you spent the night. How was that? Um, it was really cold night. I don't know if you uh, remember that night, but it was one of those nights where you could really feel the chill of winter coming in. And I think it was so hard for me because I've been sleeping out for years and years for homelessness. And usually myself and Bobby Kerr are the old stalwarts that have been doing that, fellow dragons from Dragon's Den. And to do it on your own, it's actually really hard. The camaraderie we used to have at Christchurch and then followed by the law library it was just wonderful to be with people and one of the great things about the night is you actually get to hear in camera from you know particularly women and families who have been you know put into homelessness and helped by focus on it's like having a very private conversation very intimate conversation with people that you wouldn't normally hear from in in the news and read in your newspapers and then of course we all settle down together and you know we have soup and sandwiches the same you know from a, the back of a caravan and um it just feels we're all in it together but to go outside my house and sleep in the garden on my own firstly it was eerie i think there was every sound on the planet coming from over the wall <laughs> You and live second, inside the Phoenix Park, isn't that right? You're... Well, no, I, I live in uh, Ranla, but I grew up in the Phoenix Park, okay, so I spent a lot honest. of my time in the lodge there. Yet, yeah. oh, I don't know whether I would have slept on my own outside in the Phoenix Park. Um, it was bad enough, but I could, yeah, I mean, I suppose it was comforting. I could see the lights of the kitchen, and my son stayed up with me till about four o'clock, which was great. And uh, I went in and had a cup of tea with him a couple of times to try and um, ease the, the cold out of my limbs. <laughs> Well, it's no look I'd say to you Liz there is absolutely no comparison to homelessness um by sleeping out it's nothing you know when I get crawl into my bed in the morning and imagine people having to do that every single night I I think it's a real eye-opener and it's more that we're shining a spotlight on something especially as a, in the business community and to start with it was quite a small event now it's huge and over the course of um, the time since it started it's raised millions and millions this year alone I put up a post to say we'd raised 1.3 million which was our target which was incredible it was far higher than last year but they just emailed me and said they raised 1.7 million so I often get I get overwhelmingly positive comments but sometimes you'll get one or two smart people who want to remind you that you know wouldn't you be better giving the person a bed for the night rather than you sleeping out for the night but you know what would good would that do I mean 1.7 million can make a real difference just giving one person a bed for the night although absolutely that's exactly what we should all be giving anybody who's homeless but there's a real opportunity by us collectively sleeping out to raise a reasonable amount of money to to give families their forever homes not just to stay up uh, for one night home which doesn't help anyone in the long term you know and I can pretty much guarantee you whoever's writing those comments are not sleeping out in their back garden no. for a night in the cold. So <laughs> as Brene Brown says, if you're not in the arena doing it, just keep quiet, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I love that about you. You, you, you know, you walk the walk as such, you know, lots of us can go out and have a nice 5k walk in aid of something, but uh, to spend the night out in the cold and actually get a little taster of what it might be like you know like you yeah. say there's no comparison but um yeah. to put yourself through that is something so thank you for doing that yeah Nora you know I'm aware that you've spoken a lot about grief and you probably have a, a story that rolls off your tongue at this stage and I want to try and go around that a little bit so that um you know our conversation is meaningful today yeah and I thought let's just start exactly where we are um today in Dublin 
um, it is the end of October and like we briefly said before we started recording, there's been two massive tragedies in our country, um, very personal trage tragedies in families that are shaking the nation that's already been shook. Um, we're living through a global pandemic. People are losing their jobs. People are dying. I know I've never been busier in my grief therapy practice. Um, people are trying to cope with a significant loss where they weren't able to be with the person they loved in the last weeks or months of their lives. Like we have no idea really the fallout that, that there is and that there will be from what we're living through. And just the global unrest, the political unrest, the elections coming up next week in the States. Um, fact and fiction has such a blurred line at the yeah. moment. Um, you know, the Black Lives Matters protests around around the world, following up on the heels of the Me Too movement, the cervical check scandals here in Ireland. It's like everything is up for renegotiation. How, how are you in the middle of it all? The one thing I'd say, um, first of all, is that in Ireland, um, as you've mentioned, we've had this series of tragedies, I think, beginning with the young mom and Lucan, which really rocked me, I think, um, mm. you know, the baby and the young mom and followed by the murder suicide in Canturk in Cork. And then yesterday, the mother and two children found dead in the home in Ballantyre. And I know nothing about the background to those cases other than what I read. And I don't really engage in second guessing. It's not, you know, when people are going through grief and devastation after these terrible tragedies, all we need to do is offer our condolences and our sympathies. And there is this strange thing that happens when uh, tragedies like this occur close to home is, although we don't know that person, we've no connection with them. There is something about humanity. It's almost the glue that connects us all is that we can feel their grief. And in a way, it's a reflection of maybe our own grief through people that we've lost or recognizing that if that had happened to us, how devastating it would be. So it is a strange thing because I've seen more of an outpouring of public sympathy for people going through these terrible, terrible traumas um, since the pandemic began. And in many ways, I think I have talked to colleagues who lost parents or siblings or loved ones many years ago and are only grieving especially during the first lockdown, found themselves having the space in their lives to pour over photograph albums. I did it myself. I've gone down rabbit holes many days looking at images and just getting caught up in, you know, having the time to remember all those, yeah. um, those times, the good and the bad, which has been in many ways therapeutic. Then, as you just said, I have a really good friend who just lost his brother to leukemia and, um, of course, they're under severe restrictions as regards the funeral and not being able to say goodbye properly is something that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people in Ireland can identify with right across the world can identify with. And I would say from my own point of view, being able to be with Richard through a very positive death, as in, you know, the one thing that we were afraid of the most about his illness was his death. And it ended up being the most beautiful part of it and a gift to myself and Dara that we could look back on that and say, we didn't, you know, we said goodbye in the best possible way. There was nothing I would have changed about it, holding hands with the person you love, putting your arms around them. And so many people were denied that. And, you know, you just said it there, Liz, that you can say, well, you know, so if the funeral happens and there's less people at it, what difference does it make? But for the person who's bereaved, it's everything about the journey towards that death. What happens in the aftermath, the, the collective non-social media hugs and understanding and um, time with people who mind you who just mind you really well and hold you um, in the days and weeks following that death, which is missing. And mm. yeah, long term, I think that's going to be really tough. And then the other aspect of what you said is there is a very um, healthy kickback to the establishment at the moment. I'm not a political person. I've never joined a political party. There's a very good reason why I would never go into politics, despite repeated attempts. I like to be free to say what I feel. I like to share my opinions without anybody telling me to modify them. I don't want to be owned by anybody else. And I think that's very important in terms of authenticity, that you have 
the ability in your life to say what you really think and not to feel you might be letting your party down or that you might not get another vote the next time you go to the polls. So for me, ordinary people, especially with the mother and baby homes, I, I worked very closely with the Magdalene survivors and that was certainly a huge learning for me. I thought I knew everything about it when I sat in news talk and interviewed three women who were actually in the laundry at the back of my school in Stony Batter. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. I kind of realised that during my time going to school in that convent, on the other side of it, there were young women, one of them who was in the class with me, who were put into that laundry at the back. So I got very involved in trying to help to bring them together for the first time in history and asking them what they wanted as their legacy. So many people decide what those women should, need, deserve, you know, this, this is not the way to try and help people to heal. And it's generational. I went on to run the event as an ambassador with Justice for Magdalene's amazing group. And we persuaded the president, no persuading. He put his hand up immediately to host them. Um, I got the mansion house for them. The whole of Dublin stood out in the streets to welcome them. There was something incredibly beautiful and therapeutic about doing that because for the first time, somebody listened to them. You know, we did a listening exercise with UCD. They were able to talk in their groups anonymously if they so chose. Um, and it was like watching living history, walking around that room, hearing women for the mm. first time telling their stories, hugging each other. Um, that was what real healing is all about. And then the devastation in the last while of discovering that, you know, the mother and baby homes archive was going to be sealed for 30 years. The, I think the... The fact that the state did not, I don't want to say that they weren't being honest, because I think sometimes it's cock up more than conspiracy, but there was no reason for those records to be destroyed. Nobody ever explained why that, what did the commission decide? There was nothing in the legislation that said they were going to be destroyed. So, so in fact, what we were being told is it's been rushed through because otherwise it would be destroyed. In fact, we're saving the records. The whole premise of that was false. And, you know, I have some really good legal experts that I rely on, as well as, you know, Justice for Magdalene's, the Clan Project, which is the group of survivors. So I know that that wasn't true. And yet there was a lot of spin that was happening about what the real intention was there. And I, I don't know whether the government, its ministers, its civil servants believed that they knew what was best. I don't know if they were protecting institutions from future legal action, but I do know that it was a dreadful way to treat a group of women and survivors who had already been mistreated in Ireland. It was not the right way to behave. And you can see that there was a bit of a U-turn on that yesterday, and it still remains to be seen as to whether or not they will have, uh, you know, unfettered access to their own information. And like Lauren, the for, yeah. for the sake of someone listening who's not Irish, because we have a big global listenership, and um, would you explain a little bit about what the mother and baby homes are in Ireland yeah. and why this is such a big deal, why this is a tremendous kick in the teeth for so many women? The uh, the one thing I'd say, Liz, is I've done a documentary on the Magdalene survivors and we've got two more. One hour Great, I'll, I'll link to it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they're going to be done as a more international lens because it's not just Ireland who had these institutions. Yeah. Um, a lot of Catholic countries had the same thing where predominantly women who got pregnant out of wedlock um, had their babies in a mother and baby home and the babies were often taken from them and they suffered fatalities which were far higher than the infant mortality at that time. We discovered hundreds of bodies in a, um, a sewer in one of the areas in Tume where there was a mother and baby home. And in fact, I would say, having been involved in the last Sheriff Street laundry, that if you did any site excavation under any of those institutions, you would find babies uh, who are buried there. The, the Magdalene laundries are quite different, which is why it's worth just saying that when the Pope came to Ireland and he apologised to survivors, and victims of abuse. Uh, he had never heard of the Magdalene Laundries. He never included them. I was actually in Dublin Castle when he made that apology and I was with my guest, my plus one was woman from the Magdalene Laundries and she was furious, she was upset, she was sobbing and she actually desperately wanted to hear the Pope um, apologize. And how he explained it afterwards is he didn't know what Magdalene Laundries were. They weren't uh, predominantly women who had babies out of wedlock. They could have been a woman, a, a young child who had a, a misdemeanor 
badly behaved. We had a very casual attitude to our children. If you had too many, you'd give one away. If there was a couple in the village who didn't have a baby, the parish priest might arrive and give them one in the middle of the night. Um, so the idea that these children were sometimes sent to what they called training schools um, was something that the church, the state, parents often um, worked and collaborated together. And for whatever reason, children from a very early age could end up in a Magdalene laundry, some of them coming from mother and baby homes and working free and for nothing. A lot of the times the women were given numbers rather than their own names. Um, they weren't allowed to speak to each other during the day. Look, think of that for a young child. Some of them were psychologically and also physically abused. They, if they were very, very bad, they were sent to very bad laundries, like they'd serve time in Sheriff Street, notorious, um, if they were in Limerick. And, and they, what were they working for? They were working for nothing, but who were they working for? The state. They were doing laundry for the hospitals. Yeah. Um, famously, when the president of Ireland gave a gift of lace to John F. Kennedy, it was made by women in a Magdalene laundry. So all these women then eventually, you know, go through their lives trying to seek compensation. Uh, ultimately, they achieved that in 2013. Um, there was a compensation, the, the McAleese report came out. And at that time, they were promised they could come together and they could meet for the first time and they could be asked how they'd like to be memorialized. Firstly, they dragged their feet on paying the compensation so much so that many of the women died. By the time I caught up with the whole issue um, and got hold of the Minister of Justice, Charlie Flanagan, worked with me actually eventually on this, um, got hold of the database. I now hold, in fact, the only database of the Magdalene survivors because over time, when I contacted all of them and I had a team of uh, women that worked with me, um, they had changed their names or they had different, their legal advocate was down as their uh, contact and they gave me their real contact details. There were only, say, 300 of them who could come to our event with their, um, with their carer or with their chosen relative. And uh, they were all, the stories they told were not good. They didn't leave the laundry and have a lovely, healthy, happy life. A lot of them had yeah. broken marriages. A lot of them struggled with um, alcohol, drug abuse, domestic violence, generational issue. We interviewed children and grandchildren where all of the horrors and the difficulties were passed on. For many of the women, it was the first time they even admitted to their own families they were in laundries. There was such an emotional outpouring. So if you imagine the damage you do to that group of people, and that as a state that you actively go out of your way to actually damage them further by not treating them the way that they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect and reimbursed for all the pain and the heartache and all of that unpaid labor that they did all of that mm -hmm. time I just personally it could be just me but I don't know how you live with yourself yeah. I don't know how you tell yourself every day that it's okay to do those things to add and it's add, so much more than financial reimbursement like you know in your opinion Nora what is needed what is the outcome that is needed here I do think the Magdalene Laundry um Dublin Honours Magdalene's event was for me it was a way of of actually repairing and healing a lot of damage not through compensatory means. Yeah. So compensation is one thing, but for these women to be able to come together. And, you know, if you heard them, Les, talking about, I can't believe I'm in Aris and Uktron, and they were bawling their eyes out as the president was apologizing to them. And they were sitting listening to Christy Moore and they were the queens. They were, you know, they were the ones on pedestals. When we pulled up outside uh, Dawson Street, there was buses and buses of them. And to see all these people out with placards and they kept saying, is there a famous sports star, you know, coming to Dublin? And I said, these are for you. Yeah. They just couldn't believe it. I never thought in my lifetime, these women are now, you know, in their 70s. A lot of them, one of them, in fact, was in the last stages of her life, came with her uh, nephew from Northern Ireland. And, and she said, you know, I'm I'm glad I saw this before I died. I'm glad I feel, you know, they were almost proud of being survivors rather yeah. than hiding it. It transformed them, all of their children. One woman uh, met her son for the first time at the event and uh, she was Australian or she was living in Australia. She was Irish. I just can't describe how important that was to those yeah. women and their children as a legacy piece. And we couldn't do it for the mother and baby homes because I started off doing it for the Magdalene women, but I would love to do it for the mother and baby home survivors, you know, because that's, 
of course it's mothers, but it's children who are born there. It's men and women who spend the whole of their lives trying to find out who they are, what their birth certificates are, you know, how did they come to be where they are? So things that you and I take for granted, you know. Absolutely. So. And I think, you know, because of the the current climate we're living in, people are more aware of what's going on, um, if for no other reason, but the pause button has been put on so many lives. So where we might have flicked through something before running to work, people are now sitting and actually hearing and and actually listening. Do you think yeah. the, the general public are changing their attitudes towards... Um, um, these causes that maybe don't affect them personally uh, and, and caring more. Exactly. Are, 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 are we getting more compassionate in our, the lockdown? What do you think? I think you've hit the nail on the head. The, the one thing that's really important to remember is that there is space for these kind of stories to emerge because we don't have other news stories. So what's been wonderful about this particular period, it's probably the thing that irritates everybody, is that we don't have a lot of sports headlines and we don't have a lot of news um, that dictates the column inches. And we're all sick of reading about COVID. I mean, everybody's switched off from please stop talking about it, please stop second guessing it. I think everybody knows that a lot of what you read in the newspapers or here on the television is speculation mm. without authority. So then suddenly you're in a different space in your head. We're not all racing to work. It's not the most important things in our lives. We're at home for the first time in most of our lives. We've got time with our children, our dogs to go for walks, to think about things that are important to us. And, and these stories resonate with us suddenly because we realize that that's far more important um, than perhaps listening about where business is at the moment or the economy or mm. you know I think I even think there's a big switch off on Brexit so suddenly people I think for all sorts of good reasons recognize that the most important thing is family friends your health your happiness all of the things they took for granted while they were racing around trying to get to that holiday buy that car upgrade the house you know get to work work long hours pack every evening with you know theater cinema dinners um, and so it just hit, I think it just hit at the right time. I, I have to say, I, I was so proud over the last few weeks about how ordinary people behaved around the mother and baby's home. I've never seen that before, ever. In fact, I remember doing the Magdalene Laundry event, which was 2017, and um, I was kind of talking about it. And then suddenly I was working so hard, I just went on to Morning Ireland and said, you know, he said, and what can we do? And I said, look, I'm drowning in work. But at that point, I hadn't seen anybody for two months. And I was working in a tiny microcosm of talking to the women all the time, trying to help them. None of them had mobile phones. None of them had emails, you know, trying to get them flown in. Trying to get... so I said, if you want to help, come out and welcome me yourself. I'm saying Dublin honours Magdalene's. But, you know, while the president is doing it and the minister and the Taoiseach and everything else, why doesn't why don't you come out and just welcome yourself? And I know that Dublin City Council, they phoned me on, they said, you've just created a nightmare for us in terms of crowd control. And um, But they were so, like the Gardaí were so uh, fantastic with the women and, you know, and worked so well with them. So, but, but it was the first time I had seen since 2013, since that report, that the general public woke up to the whole idea of, you know, how terrible these women had been treated. It was not something that ever made news headlines. It was not something that really spurred people to action. And then there's a bit of a lull and suddenly the mother and baby homes issue comes up and people recognised what Katrin Corliss discovered in Tum and the launch of the commission two years ago. But the outrage people had about the sealing of the archive, about things being locked away for 30 years, by, you know, the mm. feeling that the further cover up was going to happen. That was, to me, historic. I've never seen anything like that. And yeah. although the government tried to say it was hijacked by political, um, by the opposition parties, yes, of course, opposition parties will um you know they'll take ownership of putting through amendments and for good reasons many of them Ivana Bacic wow she did a great job and Alice Mary Higgins did a fantastic job so uh, but predominantly these were ordinary people I had emails from people who had never been interested before saying I don't understand the mother and baby homes thing can you answer some questions for me so yeah. it really energized people now to a certain extent, the cervical check scandal has energised everybody as well. Vicky Feeling is one powerful woman, and I feel so sorry for herself and Lorraine Walsh and um, the rest of the 221 Plus group who just seem to be consistently dragging 
the government to account and to discover that they were setting up the tribunal without even a recourse to all of the legitimate concerns the women had about adding in the laboratories, about including women who were diagnosed late, weren't included in the initial diagnosis, who may be diagnosed now in the future. Um, they set up the tribunal without answering any of that or consulting or listening to the women's voices and then um, finally agreed that they would postpone it. And then we discovered that they had to, said they had to plow on to have it established at a minute past midnight the night before last. And now I read in the paper this morning that they have now said that the reason that they couldn't prevent it from being established is they didn't have the mobile numbers of the key stakeholders. It's in the news today, the headline. Like, is that incompetence? Is that and it's, lack of you know, attention? I think 10 years ago, Nora, we would have said, oh, it's just the way it is. Politics, oh, it's just the way it is. Or the mothers and yep. babies home, it's just the way it was. Or, you know, women at work, well, that's just the way it is, you know, if you yeah. get sexual harassment. But people aren't saying that anymore. People are now standing up and um, holding our leaders accountable and demanding yeah. more. And, and I think particularly during these last few months, there's something about you know, as you say, when you're at home, you don't have your usual distractions, you're forced yeah. to confront your own vulnerability or the, yeah. the, the, the cocktail of emotions that you generally run from comes up. Yeah. And I think when we do allow ourselves to be in that vulnerable position, we are more empathetic, we're more in tune with other people and their vulnerabilities. We're able to hear something of ourselves in other people's stories. And, yeah. and, and there's, there's, there's something changing there in that. Um, and I'll tell you another thing. Um, I, I don't normally, you know, I spend my life trying to help women, more, mainly in public life, politics and the corporate world. And I work very closely with Vital Voices. It was set up by Hillary Clinton and Madeleine Albright. I'm a global ambassador for them and I'm on the European board. So I help women all over the world. And I, so, you know, you can think Irish women are worse off. I'm working with a woman in India at the moment, in Ethiopia. Um, of course, I have a, a, a lot of them across Europe and South America. And so for me, I always think economic empowerment is the most important thing for women, um, because even in domestic violence, something I've personal experience of, I walked away from that marriage saying, I'm standing on my own two feet, I'm, I'm making my own money, I'll never rely on anybody again. So it's a tremendously important thing for me. And so you look at the pandemic and you think, wow, it's not a game changer. Women are able to work from home and this could really revolutionize the way uh, women are treated in society. And in fact, they call it the she session. I'm never really good at, uh, you know, buzzwords, but actually over 11 million women have lost their jobs. I can see it in Ireland already. When it comes to the division of chores, you know, although men have certainly taken on more, women have overwhelmingly taken on um, the, the bulk of the home schooling and the homework and the cleaning. Like I, I do webinars myself and I talk to women all the time in private sessions with corporates. And last week I was talking to a group and time and again, I said, give me an insight into your day. They're like up at the crack of dawn, getting the kids ready for school, the school lunch is out the door for whatever reason, Bosses at the moment are micromanaging people who are working from home, demanding Zoom calls at eight o'clock. And so I run around, I try and get a couple of washes into the washing machine and then I put the lunch on and I know I have to have a pause at half two because the kids are coming in and then we've got homework and schoolwork. I mean, when you get a glimpse into this life of these women, there's no surprise at the end when I said, tell me honestly, would you think of leaving that two of them said they would because it was almost unsustainable mm. while the husband was working in the other office and he was happy to continue one of them had to to yeah. you know if you imagine this is going to go on for a year or two one of them had to give up their work so so what i worry about in terms of of us and our collective lives is that women are being airbrushed out i see it in government circles you look at nfet for those of you who don't know almost like any other country we have a health a group of health professionals and experts who meet predominantly men Every single time you see a news conference, predominantly men talking about coronavirus, the impact it's having on schooling, life, society. And then you look at the government and the top tier of people in the government who are dealing with anything that's of any importance at the moment, all men, all, all discussing the fact. Now, what do we know? Women in 10% of the countries of the world are led by women. They are outperforming all of the male leaders in terms of coronavirus. It's not just chance. It's yeah. just absolutely apparent that when you look at Denmark and you look at um, areas like New Zealand, Taiwan, you know, beating, like you can do, they've even done studies where they've done comparisons between, you know, Germany and France. 
you know, Denmark, let's leave Sweden out, Denmark and Norway, Iceland, you know, looking at Taiwan, looking at New Zealand versus similar population sizes. So what we do know is women are really good at this. You know, when we go through these really difficult times, when the world is tilting and everything feels a little bit odd, they're very good at a whole range of things. They've resilience, determination, women, generations of women, mothers in particular, are used to persuading people small people as well as big people to do things and not through slapping them or putting them in a corner but through persuading them to do the right thing so they're grounded in life the way all of us are at the moment you know i'll speak to the ceo of a huge corporate and his child will be in the background you know annoying him and the dog will be jumping onto his lap grounded in real life something i've never seen in business in my life if i sat into a boardroom and even admitted that i was eight months pregnant even though there was a large bump in front of me it would not be the done thing to do whereas now it's an acceptance that actually all of our lives are bound up in what's happening to us in our homes our work life has invaded our homes it's not the other way around so suddenly you have women who should be unleashed who should be achieving the great potential and at the same time, they're the first casualties. They're the Absolutely. first people to go. And I think we've talked about all of these scandals, all of these things. There's no women around the table. If there was a woman around yeah. the table and saying, you can't do that in mother and babies, so rush it through in the last few days. There's another way of doing it. Let's delay the commission. Let's find out, are they going to be destroyed? Is there another way of treating this more sensitively? So at every juncture, when I see a mistake made, I look at it and say, if there was a woman around that table, they wouldn't have done that. Absolutely. You know, I, I'm one of those soldiers, Nora. I'm five years separated. I've got four relatively young children. And I'm still, I don't think I've picked my jaw up off the ground yet in terms of the inequality and what you're left holding. Um, yeah. It's pretty insane. And yet, I took up running this year. It's a little anecdote. Um, well everyone, everyone else in my group, they're super skinny, super fit, super fast. I'm the one at the back, but I was the one who did the marathon on Sunday. Oh, well done. That's <laughs> you know? fantastic. But that was not body, not fitness, not preparation. That was mindset because I've been, okay, how do I get all these children to school, stay sane, put money on the table, pay the mortgage, run a business? I could go on. But, yeah. you know, that, that, that essentially is it. The, the one still running to the finish line, 42K <laughs> on Sunday. Pure mindset, pure that's mindset. That's very good. I'm, and, I'm, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I think I was climbing mountains at one point and um, the guy that climbs with me said, you know, it's your brain that's going to kill you rather than your body because you think you can do anything. If you, you know, it doesn't matter whether you can do it. You just have that mindset that says, I don't care if it kills me. I'm going yeah, to let's just, let's just give it a go. One. Yeah, <laughs> but it was, it was funny because they're a fabulous group of women and they're all amazing runners and they were all at the finish line and they were just looking at each other going, maybe we'll run the marathon next year. It's like, if this woman can do it, you yeah, know, great. who's always at the back of our training, always the last to arrive in. Um, well so, done. yeah, but it's, it's just a, a little example of what you're saying of like what yeah. women are capable of and we need to start listening. Nora, you mentioned there, you know, in your first marriage, you experienced domestic abuse and that was something you came out of. Met Richard, which sounds like a, a beautiful relationship. Um, I think particularly when we've had an awful relationship, we really cherish it when we get a good one. Yeah. Um, and then unfortunately, Richard died. Um, yeah. I think five years ago, Nora. Yeah, Is that right? two years ago yeah, now. Yeah, two years yeah. Ago. Those experiences, you know, that you were that person, you were that vulnerable person in that home, being uh, uh, subjected to domestic violence, where you should have been safe. How have they formed who you are today, and why you sit there for three months on end, taking phone calls from other survivors? I think. Um... I always say that um, in my lifetime, people, you mentioned I was a nurse and um, anybody who starts off wanting to be a nurse isn't out to make billions. They're not out to rule the world. They're out to make a difference to people's lives. And um, I'd say, I say to everybody, that's my mindset. You know, the reason I work on human rights and justice issues is because I am a hybrid in terms of I desperately want to change people's lives and society and at the same time I also recognize that I wouldn't be able to do that without being an entrepreneur and being somebody who went out and created the kind of wealth that would make sure I didn't have to rely on anybody else and 
that didn't happen by chance. It happened through the bad things you're talking about. It's, it's a very hard description to make to people. I, um, I actually only really admitted to myself in recent years all of those terrible things that happened to me in my 20s. I, I think I came out of that relationship never wanting to think about it. I almost airbrushed that time out of my life. In fact, apart from my mother and my sister, some you know, very good friends of mine didn't even know that I had that marriage. So that's how hidden and buried I kept that. I think I, what I discovered, sometimes you look back with forgiveness and a lens of time, you can understand why things happened. And I, you know, like almost everything, anything bad that happens to me, I end up delving into the science. I, th I think people don't know that about me is that I published peer reviewed journals for a chunk of my life. Um, my claim to fame was launching evidence-based practice with the British Medical Journal and started my MPhil and PhD at the University of Wales. So whenever I struggle with anything, I, I'm the person who delves into research and science and I've worked with all the famous collaborative universities in the world. So I have great networks to hand. So I did spend a lot of time in recent years trying to discover how I ended up spending nine years with my first husband and, and why... I couldn't leave him. It was something that really, really tormented me. And um, and I felt very bad about myself. I, I was very critical of myself that I could be so stupid and um, such a doormat that I would allow somebody to do those things to me and and not walk away on the first instance. And, and I have admitted that he slapped me and hit me and damaged me quite hard before we even got married. So I haven't even got the excuse that I was married at that time. But I think that very few people understand how complex it is when you can love somebody and you're going through this terrible circle of honeymoon where you're the princess and you're everything they ever wanted you to be and they love you and adore you and they're remorseful. And then you go through that walking on eggshells phase, which I remember more than anything else, butterflies in your stomach, wondering if you see the wrong thing, if you do the wrong thing, if you slam the door, if you look the wrong way and into the violence and uh, the abuse and I don't know you just become slightly addicted to it you know there's some strange hold that he had on me I, I discovered afterwards that quite often abusers um, will will be attracted towards empathetic people and of course I was transitioning from being a nurse to being a journalist and sometimes they find people who are actually struggling with grief from the death of a parent or a grandparent but um, I do know that in later life, when I met other women like me, we were almost talking over each other. I couldn't believe the similarities. You know, he told me he loved me within the first two days. Oh, that happened to me. And, you know, he, he very quickly started telling me how wonderful I looked and how amazing I was and then said, are you seriously going out wearing that? And, you know, he controlled what I wore, what I bought. And um, and I would say that. Um, I ended up doing the TED talk, you know, How Did You Leave, which I'm doing a documentary on at the moment. Um, well, I'm involved in one with the BBC, but um, which is focused very much on that idea and not why did you stay, but how did you leave? I think it's a new research area, but if you could gather together women who collectively gave testimony on how they left, we might learn something. For me, it was telling my mum, you know, after a very violent episode where he broke my ribs, broke a bone in my face, I always say that, you know, this side of my mouth goes down instead of up. I've tried to get it fixed, but it's very badly damaged here from that incident. And so sometimes when I'm smiling, I, I try not to open my mouth because I'm reminded, you know, when you're at your happiest in your life, you're reminded of this terrible incident that happened, which wasn't anything but happy and um, I kind of promised I would leave and after many failed attempts I used to drive I was in um, near Wimbledon in London and I drove to Harrow to go to work and every Friday I would drive home promising it would be that weekend I would leave him and every Monday I'd cry all the way into work thinking why didn't I have the bottle to leave him and and telling my mum she had witnessed not not the offence, but she saw the aftermath and she suspected, you know, he slapped me very hard across the face while my mum and dad were staying and they didn't see it, but <coughs> she saw the red marks down my face and my father kept saying, have you got a rash or what's going on? But she knew because I saw her tackling him outside next to the car and when I went home the following weekend, she asked me and I told her and I kind of knew if I didn't leave him, firstly, my brothers would probably have murdered him and they'd be still serving life imprisonment. But I knew I had to do something. And I can't tell you 
why I'd written this speech a million times um, in my head and I'd even handwritten it. I found it the other day and I woke him up at about four o'clock. I'd had a shower, I packed a small bag. It was a Friday morning and I woke him up and said, you know, I'm, I'm leaving you. He started to laugh and, you know, got back to bed and I started making my speech about the violence and how it was untenable and um, I could hear him snoring in the background. He just fell back to sleep in the middle of my lovely speech. So I went downstairs, I had a small little red car and I drove away and I felt like I was falling off a cliff. I didn't, I don't know how I even drove. I spoke to my younger sister who by then knew and she calmed me. It's a long journey from Wimbledon to Harrow. And I knew I couldn't, you had to go to work. Nobody in my workplace knew what was happening. Um, and I, at the same time, there was this kind of strong bit inside me that said, that's never going to happen again. You know, firstly, I was terrified I might go back to him and he tried everything in his power, including threatening to take his own life to get me back. Um, but secondly, there was this kernel of, I don't care what you have to do. You have to earn enough money for that never to happen again. You know, I had no home. All of my clothes was in the wardrobe back room. Everything I owned was back in that house. I stayed in the Ibis at Heathrow Airport that night, 49 99 the cheapest I could find, paper thin walls, listening to families going off on holiday and in loving, beautiful relationships while I'm on the floor, wondering where I was going to live, what I was going to do, how I was going to cope, where the money was going to come from. So I would never have been who I am now without that terrible, awful nine years, because then I went on to obviously focus my energies on being chief executive, being the boss, working towards owning my own businesses. I would never have met Richard, as you I'm said. I'm sure you there could... was a, a period of hell in between the, yeah. that Ibis night and becoming a CEO. Yeah, but there was never anything as worse as the previous nine. Yeah. Never anything as worse. Yeah. I felt I was, you know, I'd hit the bottom and I was on my way back up again. I mean, it really does help if you've had a terrible partner to find such an amazing one and Richard was an amazing one a life's ambition after two years of IVF I had a baby now a big strapping 21 year old um, who saves me in every way possible just the most brilliant like I, I I wanted a baby for so long and then you know had this beautiful baby which is part Richard and part me it was it was almost like you know your happiness is spilling over at that point when you I suppose if you have really bad times, you really appreciate the good ones. So for me, I went through my 30s believing that I could do anything. There was nothing I couldn't do because I now had this amazing man. I'd you know, got this amazing child and um, rolloping on towards doing a management buyout and running multiple companies across London and Dublin was nothing. Um, I probably had a great deal of um, ambition, but also a great deal of self-belief. And that I didn't grow up with that. I was not a confident child. Uh, you know, I told you I started off as a nurse and um, in many ways an angel. I went on to be a journalist because I love writing. It's my big thing, broadcasting. And then went on to be, um, you know, a dragon, for want of a better word, from an angel to a dragon. Who like, who made me that way? <laughs> it's like you bring po the, the term post-traumatic growth to a whole other level, Nora. It's a hard, but it's a hard conversation because... Yeah. For a lot of women, they don't recover as well as that. And yeah. I do think that if you have children, uh, we hear stories always at the end of the domestic violence relationship, either through death, uh, through injury, through fleeing for their life and the lives of the child. Um, I spend most of my time in the domestic violence space trying to work with young women and young men to help them identify toxic relationships. Because I do think that if I knew back then as a young, you know, 22, 23 year olds, what um, what the reality of my relationship was, that if he hits you once, he's never going to stop. I might not have ended up marrying him and staying as long with him. So I, I would, you know, personally like to focus my energies, which I do in that space of the, you're not allowed to say 16, but the reality is it's 16 to early 20s, um, trying I'd, to help people. And I'd really love to just go back to something you said there about it's how it's hard to explain to people why you stay and, you know, something happens, you know, what's wrong, but then something else happens, you get flowers or an apology or you're treated like a princess. 
and often our bodies are telling us one thing like you explained your guts there and the butterflies and you know what's going to happen next and walking on eggshells but our heads are making up different stories or trying to rationalize it or exactly. make meaning and I think if we were to say one thing to anybody it's listen to your body yeah. Well, listen, what um, is your body doing? Is your body moving towards this person or away from this person? Does your body feel safe? There's there's a good barometer there um, yeah. to trust a little bit more perhaps than some of the stories we can tell ourselves when we're in those really exactly. traumatic situations. I, mean, I, I myself feel that um, for a lot of women who manage to leave you know unscathed I mean I didn't leave unscathed I had lots of physical abuse um and psychological but I do think that um telling somebody was a big issue for me I was very isolated from my family and friends and I never admitted it to anyone and it did help um it, it's when you're trapped financially, as well as um, in terms of, you know, if you think of all the things that support you in your life, you know, I'm in his house, he even had my passport, he has the money. Somehow I ended up paying the bills, but he had all the money that was used to spend. Um, nothing that I stood up in was my own. Nothing was um, was there for me. I didn't have the financial freedom to swan out the door. I mean, yeah. if I was a millionaire at the time, I would have said, yeah, cheerio, I'll, I'll buy my own house now. Thanks very much. And then on top of that, you convince yourself that the friendship aspect, I, I remember listening to the Nicole Kidman character in Big Little Lies, which ironically and very stupidly was the one that probably nudged me into speaking about it where she's talking to her psychologist all the time and she's saying but you know he's a great father and he's a great friend yeah. and we have such good times and and you do tell those lies to yourself all the time that you know that very violent episode that happened oh he was remorseful he cried my husband towards the end threatened to take his own life many times which is one of those things as a nurse in me you know you're you're all the time saying oh my god could I live with myself if I walked away and he took his own life and it would be on me um so of course he didn't and he ended up with another relationship he's dead now but you know at the time, I think you're feeding into all of those different triggers and in, inside you, you know, yeah. it's complicated. And and, and the, the fact that he was a nice father or a kind or a good friend, that can all be true and an abuser. You know, yeah. the, the, it's the paradox of it. You're not either or you can be all of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, so you, Richard was wonderful. You said he you had <laughs> many good years. Dara came yeah. after... Um, some some years of IVF as well a much wanted yeah. baby yeah he was and then life happened again Nora and Richard yeah, big side swap. um and I I can't describe why that floored me so much but my sister died a few months um before Richard got sick so it was like the Anna Cerebellus in my family you know mm. and my father died when you know Dara was very young he had a heart attack in his sleep and of course like everybody there's nobody listening to this that hasn't got grief. And, you know, it's one of the things that we carry through our lives. Sometimes when it's out of sequence, it's a little bit harder. Um, you know, if it's a sibling or your partner or God forbid your child. Um, but I think I sort of survived all of those other uh, episodes of grief because Richard was next to me. And, and we were together in everything. You know, he worked for the BBC for 20 years. And then when we we were in London for a long time and uh, when we came back home, he took a sabbatical, did a stint with RTE, went back to the BBC. Anyway, over time, when I was buying the businesses, we realised that, look, if the whole of our lives at the time we were remortgaging the house, I mean, everything we owned was, to, you know, it was all caught up in trying to run the businesses. So let's do it together. And although he was not... A financial person which suits me because I am <laughs> you know he didn't nothing to do didn't want to know anything about the finances or the business side of the strategy he's no one else of, was ever going to hold your purse strings again Nora. he didn't want he didn't want yeah. to be anything to but he was a great broadcaster yeah. great journalist great editor and he ran all the editorial teams so it was fantastic for us as a business that he had these fantastic skills that he ran with and I had mine and unlike other people who talk about couples and the business is quite big at the time and you know we weren't seeing each other during the day but we'd catch up at night time and never it was never uncomfortable for Richard and I talked about you know our dreams of the future and what we were going to do and you know the idea of going into broadcasting he was already a, a commissioner for uh, not a commissioner he was a, somebody who could be commissioned by the BBC it's a status which is hard fought by and um 
and I think when he left, like it was as much, it was a brutal and very short illness. He was 48. Um, we actually went to a party with Mags Nelson, who, for those of you who don't know, ran FM 104, very gregarious, funny woman. And um, I knew her husband too from uh, work in London. So we went to her house this night. It was one of those fantastic party nights where everyone was singing. Richard, who could hardly sing a note, sang four songs. Somebody was up doing Irish dancing. And the next day he said he had a very bad pain in his back and we were making lunch, Sunday lunch for my mom and my sister. And I was ribbing him saying, you've had too much glasses of wine last night. And he said, no, I'm going to have to go up and lie down in the bed. And um, that was the start of it. He peed bright red blood, got in touch with his GP, eventually ended up um, in hospital and through the two weeks um, or so that they were doing investigations, they eventually found a, a tumor in his um, in his kidney, in the wet bladder area of his kidney, very unusual, and thought that was it. And we were gonna plow on with an operation and some chemo, but a few weeks later, they discovered it was also three in his liver and uh, one in his spine. And they decided that um, they would do some radiotherapy on the spine before they started chemo, but the tumor shifted and it cracked his spinal column. So within about three weeks of diagnosis, he was in a wheelchair. He couldn't have emergency surgery in the matter spinal unit because the cancer was so pervasive and they thought it better to start his chemo. And there was only months then of terrible news. Like it was just, we got no, there was just no remission. There was no pause. Every single time we went in, despite this toxic triple dose chemo he was having, they would find more cancer. Or Did you find... have hope, Nora? Did you think he would? We thought we first? would always be the one. You know, I mean, our oncologist told us time and again, sorry, but nine out of 10 people with your level of cancer, Richard, they don't survive. And we'd say, how long do we have? I don't know how long you have. And we'd go out there. So we'd... Somebody has to be the one, you know? And then you learn in those very intense periods to talk in the moment. Like I just remember being in James's and we moved out of the private hospital system into the public system because cancer is much better in the regional centers. So we'd sit in these tiny chairs and go through hours and hours of chemotherapy, sometimes well into the night. He never wanted to stay over. So we'd get up at the crack of dawn, get the blood tests, wait, hang around, constantly talking about the coffee, the weather. because. But we couldn't talk about Christmas, we couldn't talk about holidays, we couldn't talk about anything in the future because, you know, it was just so painful because you knew that person was not going to be with you. So we never even went there. And I can't tell you how difficult it is to stay in the moment all the time, to keep dragging that head of yours back with a will of iron into the present. And he was in a wheelchair across the whole time. I'd say, were well, you okay? Are you comfortable? Can I? So... And then he ended up in the hospice and he didn't end up in the hospice to die. He ended up there because he had very bad bone cancer in his ribs and his spine and everywhere. And it was very, it's very hard to control palliatively. And yeah. the oncology unit kept saying, you know, you'll have to go and see a specialist. And there's a guy called Paul Gregan, who is an incredible palliative care specialist. He's in Blackrock Hospice. So we went there for assessment. Now, by then, they had said to Richard and me that he should pack up his affairs is the word they used you know okay um how did we land with you Nora um I remember the day really really well because it was one of those very long days where we were waiting on scan results and to see if he could have more chemo it was a constant juggling act and this uh, our own doctor wasn't there and a doctor who who didn't have um English as a first language was giving us the results of the test and we didn't quite understand what he was saying, but but the gist of it was they found more cancer in Richard's lungs for the first time. And he kept saying, so that's it. And we kept saying, so what do you mean by that's it? And he said, well, that's it. You know, you have cancer here, here and here, and we found it in your lungs, so that's it. And um, we walked out of there and got as far as the car. And I said, did you understand that? And he said, I hope it's not what I think it is. And I said, let's go back. So we went back up and we sat for about an hour and a half while they called our doctor. And um, she said, well, what he was trying to say is that you need to put your affairs in order, Richard. And he kept saying, what does that mean? You always want 
actual details, you know, and she said, well, I think that this is the end of the treatment phase. I don't think there's anything else we can do. Your cancer is just not. She said, if people could go on holiday and their cancer wouldn't spread. Yours is spreading even when we give you the chemo. Mm. And So much uh, ambiguity around the... Mm. The, well, doctors, I mean, I know the... myself, like, you know, nobody knows. So Richard wanted to next week. Is it the week after? If I got a month, mm-hmm. if I got two months? And she said, I don't know, Richard. I really don't know. Um, but your cancer is progressing very fast. And mm. so um, we actually couldn't go home. I remember going into the car and I was um, shaking so much and he was too and um, overwhelmed with upset. I went to my mom. We were in James's and my mom lives in the lodge in the Phoenix Park. We couldn't go home to Dara, you know, no way could we go home to Dara because we hadn't even caught up with Dara from the initial diagnosis, which was, yeah. it's grand, he's got a cancer and it's all going to be treatable. And then this terrible stuff was happening all day, every day. So we went up to my mom and she put us together. And my mom was, um, come from a long line of nurses. My mom was a psychiatric nurse, but she went on to do counselling after we were raised and she worked in the Carrie Cheshire home in Phoenix Park and mm-hmm. she's just got a wonderful way about her in terms of, I guess, life and it, it, she's calming and she says the right things and she put us together. Definitely. What did, what did she say or do? I don't remember exactly because we were talking about it recently. I think she just made tea and held us. And she just yeah. talked about it, you know. Um, she didn't try to fix it or change it oh, or no. ignore it. Yeah. No. No, she listened. Mm. And and we were shocked. And, you know, I think people, the tendency with some people would be to try and say, oh, sure, it might never happen, you know. <laughs> you might have two years. And uh, it, she, she has a very quiet acceptance about these things, which is, and of course, you know, we just say goodbye to my sister, which is hard for her. Um, so, and we were able to go home. And then John Crown picked us up in Vincent's. We asked him, could he see? He's got very, he's a great man, as you know, and does experimental um, chemotherapy. Founded in a lot of clinical research. So Richard started attending with him. And we honestly hoped, as he did too, that he we were could still maybe, clinging on. Yeah, that we could yeah. buy a year. That's what we, that was the kind of, the bargain um but very early in that stage she went for palliative assessment and all of the fears he had about going to the hospice i mean it was going to the hospice for him even though it was an assessment for palliative care he felt it was the end and it was a really hard journey in the car really hard pulling up outside the hospice and walking inside and then there were these beautiful people and they had books on a table richard loved books and you know, it was this amazing restaurant, canteen, but God, compared to James's, and I'm sorry, James's, but, you know, here was this lovely space where you could get a homemade soup. Richard wasn't eating a lot at the time. And and these great people, I remember Paul Gregan, we went into the room and he sat and said, lovely to meet you, Richard, and uh, tell me what happened to you. The simplest question. Nobody had asked Richard that. Nobody. All of his interactions were about bad results. There were about rushed blood scans, his diagnosis, where he was at. Nobody, from the beginning of this massive roller coaster, nobody had said, just tell me what happened to you. It was magical. Just a bit of humanity. And time. Yeah. He listened, you know, and time. And then when Richard, very soon after that, within a few days, they changed his drugs around. He was sleeping like 23 hours and I knew he wasn't doing well. He was really, really struggling. And the uh, hospice nurse came to see us and she said, I think we should bring Richard in for a couple of weeks and stabilize his drugs and everything else. But when he went in there, he um, developed pneumonia. Like I, you know, I'm a nurse and I am grounded in reality. But I remember one of the nurses kept saying to me, you know, your husband is very sick. And I was like looking at her, are you mad? Of course, I know he's sick. He's got cancer everywhere. But she said he's very sick. And I wasn't twigging what she was saying to me at all. I was, you know, walking out into the car. And then one evening I said to her, when you keep saying Rich is very sick, she said, yeah, I think he's very, very sick. And it was starting to seep in that maybe we were in the end phase, but still not in a way that I took it on board then 
one day, this is only a matter of days, by the way, so you might imagine it's not. I mean, Richard um, and myself and Dara were together and uh, weirdly enough, Richard has a beautiful BBC voice. It's like they call it warm chocolate. Like all my friends in London would say, I woke up to your divine husband speaking <laughs> on. <clears throat> it's called um, um, the Today Show in BBC Radio 4. You know, he was a mainstay of that. And I woke up to your husband. Oh, he had this velvety, gorgeous voice. And and he used to read to Dara every night from when he was a baby. Like we used to take turns and Dara very quickly said, well, I'll have daddy if you don't mind, you know. <laughs> But then, and he read this poetry, Richard, you'll see in my, in my office here, it's full of Richard's Shakespeare's and books. He's very, uh, he did English literature and he used to read this particular poetry book to Dara every night and a very famous poem, which is from the war, I won't mention it. But in these days, Richard was in bed feeling very um, unwell and sleepy and Dara was reading to him. It was quite an extraordinary wow. thing. So I'm, I'm in the room with Dara reading his poem to Richard and uh, Paul Gregan came in and said, just for uh, the sake of uh, clarity and for all sorts of ethical reasons, I feel that I should have a chat with Dara, with the two of you present, to explain where we're at. And Richard said, I would prefer if you, as in me and Dara, did that in another room. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. And I said, OK. <clears throat> so myself and Dara went into the, the side room and... Um, so Paul Gregan described every bit of the body and showed Dara where all the cancer, you'd be hard pressed to find any organ that there wasn't cancer in. And he explained all that in great detail to Dara. And then he said, do you want to ask me a question? And Dara said, um, is my dad going to die? I nearly fell off the floor. I would never have asked that question. And Paul Gregan said, yeah, he's going to die. And he said, and when is he going to die? And he said, in the next day or two. And that's that's how we found out and that's how Richard found out because while myself and Dara were distraught in the side room Paul Gregan said you know I owe it to Richard to go in and talk to him now about what we've talked about and um, when he went into the room Richard said did Dara ask the hard question and he said he did and he said and what did you answer and he said I said yes and that it would be in the next day or so and you know what that gave us um, Liz it gave us the only possibly the only moment of honesty in his death where the three of us hugged each other and he was able to say to Dara all of the things that he wanted to say everything and then he stopped and said now read me the poem again Ugh. and he slipped into a, a coma uh, about 24 hours later and yeah. he died which is <clears throat> in many ways he'd withdrawn from all his friends in the final weeks um he's, he had lovely men friends a really big club of men they called themselves the curry club a lot of brits that were estranged in ireland and they went out regularly and they'd had a final supper with him and um when he's finally slipped into that uh, deep sleep uh, they all wanted to see him so we had his final day in black rock hospice where they all came and they all sat, some just to pray, some to have a chat. Uh, one man and his wife came in to show him their new baby. And at the end of all of that, and myself and Dara and my family had dinner with them. And they left. And my brother stayed upstairs. And um, you know what's ridiculous when people are going to die is that you imagine after everything, that you'll be in the toilet <laughs> when it happens <laughs> or you might fall asleep so I'm in this room with Richard and it's warm and I'm trying to stay awake and I'm exhausted because you know we've had long days and I'm thinking oh my god if I fall asleep and he takes his last breath and I was holding his hand and there was hypnotic breathing which wasn't helping and um, then this nurse came in Tracy who I've met since and she said, would it help if I sat opposite you? And I said, it would. So she held his other hand. And she started asking me, she said, I knew you were a nurse. I was a nurse in Scotland in Loughlin. And I was telling her these funny stories about being a nurse. And she was, and we were whispering, but laughing softly. And he took his final breath. Then. And I think, how beautiful is that? 
not to have silence, which it would have been with me, yeah. but to hear the murmur and the comfort of voices who aren't strained or in pain. Like we were genuinely, yeah. I didn't expect him to die that quickly. And, you know, so we were genuinely just chatting to each other. And I do remember that murmuring and the little bit of laughter, low and quiet, but how comforting that would have been for him. With to know you're okay. And I'm holding his hand and Tracy yeah. is holding his hand. And I, there was no drama. I didn't phone a million people. Everyone knew he was going to pass away. So it was nice. I had some time with him on my own. My brother was upstairs in the, in the accommodation and I didn't even phone him. I just said, just leave me with Richard. It was the middle of the night. Um, and um, eventually we waited till morning. And then, of course, I came home to Daryl. It wasn't... I think in the aftermath, what I would say is, of course, I missed Richard, but it was like my whole life had gone. It was like a big boulder had come down and just arrived in front of me because we had um, over a bottle of wine on most New Year's Eve, like everybody else, you know, we imagined what we would do and the fruits of our labor and where we would go and all the things that we should have been able to do. And I couldn't figure out how to do that without him, you know. It was the absence of the future, yeah. as well as his absence, which really derailed me. Now, to the outside world, did it look like I was derailed? I picked myself up and myself and Dara went back to work in school and you know tried to put routine into our lives um my mom who was keen for me to spend a bit of time dealing with the grief suggested we might go to the countryside which we did for a few months um with the forest and the streams but you know sometimes you're not good company for your own brain and yeah I don't I don't, I don't for me and Dara I don't think it was the most therapeutic thing we walked every day and there was so much time weighing heavily on us and people wanted to stay away to give us space so it was even worse and but actually you need people around you to mm. regulate you and to just feel bodies nearby just yeah. feel people's presence where there's such an absence and then I'm in this cocoon and they <laughs> TV3, as it then was, Virgin Media called me up and said that Vincent Brown had gone on holiday and would I fill in for him for a night or two. So you have to remember, this is like, I don't know, um, maybe seven months after Richard had died. I'd done a season of Dragon's Den and I was now taking like the summer months off. And he died in October, so... Um, we just had his anniversary so it's the summer after that when I'm in the Wicklow house and the the idea of me having a conversation with anybody was just so remote I couldn't hardly speak to anyone I you know if people say sorry for your troubles I would just say you yeah, thanks very much I couldn't string a sentence together my yeah. mum couldn't even get me to talk your and... brain is so <coughs> affected in grief everything is so in fact mm. affected in grief and then I said yeah I'll, um, I'd love to fill in for Vincent Brown. <laughs> and I is the most extraordinary thing. I remember driving up and my mom was going, are you sure about this? Like, you know, are you sure you're up to this? You should, you're supposed to be spending time on your own. I'd be grand, I'd be grand. I remember going to Ballymount and pulling up in front of the building and like just looking at it with that like flash of reality saying, what the actual, I'm not going to say the expletive, are you doing? Go ahead. <laughs> I was actually looking at the building with this kind of dawning, oh my God, what are you thinking of? Not even sitting opposite Vincent Brown on the sofa, but being Brinson. Now, in my <laughs> 20s, I, of course, I presented programs for, you know, the BBC. I had my own show on LBC, but I mean, this is a million light years away. So mm. I go in and, and worse, it was on the fiscal treaty. It was just one of the worst topics where, you know, it was people like Pat Rabbit and all kinds of, you know, European legislation and finance bent and, and I'm in the boardroom and the producer who I subsequently got to know very well, kept saying to me, great, Nora, delighted to have you. It's like two o'clock and the show is going out that night. So you spend the whole afternoon going through research, piles of research, which is like it's like Ulysses. You see, you read a sentence and in my brain, it was slithering was, straight out the other side. Well, we was, all know that most people can't even read for the first two years after grief. I couldn't take it in. And she kept saying, how are you doing? And I said, grand. And then I'd go to the toilet and throw up. I threw up the whole afternoon. And just Not to make surprised. it seem better, I kept taking slices of the notes and putting them to one side. She said, I've done all them. I couldn't do any of them. So 
it comes to the time of the program and I had a red rash started here, went all the way down my chest. I mean, a florid red rash. She kept saying, are you okay? Do you need an antihistamine? I'll be fine. I couldn't speak. There was a lump in my throat, my head, my heart was it's like, I'm talking a severe case of anxiety and stress. And I'd already mess, met the other guests, all politicians. And um, the autocue was up. It was like blur in front of me. And um in my ear, because it's like, you know, 20 seconds, 10 seconds, then the opening music. And I, how I didn't get up and rip my earpiece out, I do not know. But I don't know what happened. I ended up obviously introducing the show before I knew it, they were saying it's, you know, 20 seconds to finish and it, we're doing the countdown. And like, to me, it was a blur, a blur, just a blur. Mm. And um, but somehow you went into autopilot. I was on such a high coming out. Wow. I spoke to my mother and I was, did you hear him? And did you hear what I said? And when he said that, I just reminded him that he didn't know about the, and she's going, would you listen to yourself? You're on fire. Like, you know, I've never seen you like this for seven months. Well, for a year, because, you know, Richard she said, oh my God, you are a totally different person. And I realized something really important that, you know, if, if in your personal life, I, I, I wrote a book on this, uh, Liz, but, you know, I got very interested in dopamine and things that help you to feel better, you know, but, you know, because Richard was my dopamine, he was everything to me and he patted me and told me how much he loved me. And then he's gone and I'm like going through a crack cocaine, you know. Um, yeah, you're fueled by adrenaline, cortisol, yes, all the stress hormones. Everything has crashed yeah. for me. And, and then this other part of my brain, was just getting switched on to this intellectual novelty, risk-taking new information. And of course, this was fueling all sorts of different mm. kinds of energy. And, you know, I'll describe it to you at a time. I probably ate more carbs than I've ever eaten in my life. I couldn't, there was no emotional state I wouldn't eat my way through. If people suggested I got off the couch to go for a walk, they'd be lucky to survive to get to the front door to get out of the house. And here I am on the phone to my mother, not on the, on the speakerphone, going, blah, blah, blah. I was talking constantly. And then I went back in and I did it the next night. And then News Talk said, do you want to try and replace Ivan Yates for a year on News Talk Breakfast? And I tried out for it and I took it. Got up at four o'clock every single day for a year. If I said to you or any of your listeners, do you want to get up at four o'clock every morning next week? They might be feeling, I did it for a year. And it they probably hadn't me. even fallen asleep, uh, most yeah. likely in Probably. grief when you're lying <laughs> awake at night. But firstly, I was going to yeah. bed at nine o'clock with Dara after we did our homework. I was getting up at four, getting all his stuff ready and a really lovely woman came in to uh, get him to school. I was with him every afternoon when he came in. We did our homework together because at the six o'clock news conference every night, we I had my homework for interviews the next day. From seven to 10, I was interviewing, broadcasting. My brain was full of stuff. You, I, a conversation, I wouldn't shut up. You know, it was far from, you know, I have nothing to say because I'm mush. It was, uh, I knew yeah. a small amount about everything, irritatingly so. I probably ditched it all out of my head. But there wasn't a single topic that I didn't know, some little thing of that. And then I took on RT Cork on a Friday with Blanadney Coffee. We we did the Fridays, like a loose women format, to, with um, which is currently Dahi and um, uh on the there's a Sinead has joined them I think this season but we did the Fridays so I had a guy who was an out of work taxi driver who drove my car picked me up at News Talk when I was an absolute wreck at the end of the week from the 4 a.m starts and I had a duvet and pillows in the back seat and I slept all the way to Cork and I arrived there about one o'clock and then the makeup girl would say would you like some lashes Nora I said I'd love some lashes just put them all on and I'd have this lovely glamorous thing with Blonard and we had one treat on the way back we went to the garage outside of um, the city and we bought a bottle of wine and two plastic cups and that was my social life so the drive home um, with that poor man in the front god he'd probably write his memoir someday and <laughs> it'll be a blockbuster yeah. <laughs> we drank a bottle of wine for the three hours back yeah and I was home in bed at half nine so yeah so what I'm hearing what I'm hearing from you is that action was so important for you in your grief. Yeah, I think I, I did. But the passive TED... grief didn't work for a while. No, I think I did a TED talk on the cure for grief is motion. And for me, it was moving forward. I think I would have ended up in that complex grief because I had a tendency to look backwards. The what ifs was always a big thing mm. for me. And, you know, the life that we could have had and pouring over, you know, 
when you're working together, all Richard's emails were coming to me. You know, after he died, yeah. I, you know, I was constantly wrapped up with people in the world. Constantly work. having to remember and tell people. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think I could very easily have ended up in, in that complicated grief where I just switched off from life. The only thing that was getting me out of bed was actually Dara. And, um, and then um, this happened out of nowhere. This idea of, you know, abject terror maybe and novelty and my brain being on fire about something that was totally different and I, I handed the company over to my brother and I said I'm just going to stand on my own two feet because it's very intellectually stimulating when there's no one I'm not the queen of any bloody boardroom I'm not the dragon in dragon's den it's not my job if the cameraman goes off sick but it is my job to perform very well and to make sure I'm prepared and so it really shook me into a totally different chapter not the one I wanted but you know, a, a great one in many ways. And then in the same way in my 20s, when I was going through a bad um, marriage, I worked my way through it. I mean, I just a workaholic. I mean, when I look back at my 20s, people said, how did you do all of that? How did you do, you know, I did postgrad journalism. I went to Ealing College every night for two years to do TV production. In my spare time, I was working for Sky on a Saturday, LBC on a Sunday, the BBC. Anytime I got, I was holding down a print job went off to do my MPhil, my PhD, then realized I was a terrible manager and went to Ashridge Management College to study strategic. I'm exhausted listening to myself even telling you that. But there was no minute of that day, my waking hours that were not filled with stuff that was going to get me through my personal life. And the same happened when Richard died. I, you know, I remember um, one of the comedians saying there's loads of jobs in Ireland. It's just that Nora Casey has them all, you know, because there I was doing breakfast on News Talk. Mm. I, I took on a new show called The Takeover. I did 13 episodes during this three year period. I did one season of Dragon's Den, which was my last one. I did 13 episodes of The Takeover and um, I wrote my book and I did the Friday show. Um, I, I, it's unfathomable to me now. I look back and think, how did you do that? Yeah. But I think writing the book was the I went from doing the breakfast show after just over a year I, I moved to a Sunday show my own Sunday show breakfast was a killer for me I couldn't really do anything else <clears throat> and then gradually I realized you know what I could just make my own decisions instead of saying yes I could just and that's when I started working with the young traveler women and doing things I did a, a documentary called Death and the Irish which was my own author journey through um, going back to Black Rock Hospice talking to Paul Gregan and things um, doing the TED talks you know working with the Magdalene survivors, deciding to sell the chunk of the business. Um, and I, I think that it just took me maybe a little longer um, to, I would say this is the first year when I've truly stopped and thought about my next chapter. You know, I think I've been galloping, thinking that time is going to run out if I don't work yeah. doubly hard, you know. A tremendous life force. But also yeah. when you do get yourself to the top, you know, it's a different view. It's like, well, what matter? You know, I have conquered so much. Yeah. Now what's left and what matters? Yeah, I work pro yeah. bono almost all of the time. Um, mm. I still have some magazine. I have a digital learning platform. I have some investments. But by and large, I'd say almost all my days are pro bono um, and mm. primarily working with women or SME founders and trying to make a difference in areas that you've just talked about. Like, you know, I have my own areas like homelessness and um, particularly women, survivors, domestic violence. Um, and I think that's something I really want to concentrate on if I can, you know, if I can spend time doing that, I get a, a great deal of reward from it. It's a two way street. Mm. It's not just me. Absolutely. Giving. Yeah. Um, but I do recognize that um, sometimes I'm not doing the things that I feel I would like to do as a legacy piece you know I have two books on the go and both under contract both under deadline the first one was with Penguin and it's got a second edition and instead of finishing the two books I started writing another one like I you know I feel sometimes my focus is not there I I sort of I think in the pandemic where my head was at was writing the third one um, which was about adversity and resilience some of the things we've been talking about mm. you know so what matters now, Nora? What My boy matters, matters a great yeah. deal. Um, he's, you know, he's uh, he's always laughing. I, I'm always looking at him saying, look, and I made you myself. <laughs> he's my life's work. He's, uh, you know, I mean, my mom is is 90. Um, mm. 
uh, we've had a lot of family illness. Um, I think cancer took a seat at my family's table and seems very reluctant to leave it. So while most people were worried about COVID, we have had a really tough pandemic. So I've really appreciated the fact that I've the time to actually uh, be the nurse in the family, which I'm very much the nurse in the yeah. family. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm racing between, I have one coming up actually in about four minutes, if you don't mind, okay. to look after my mom. Um, so yeah, those things have meant a great deal to me. And like everyone else, I'm treading water, just seeing what's going to happen. Mm. No big strategy. You know, let's see where we go with the pandemic and what's going to happen next. Not make any yeah. big plans. But kindness shines through in what you're saying. Thank you. That doctor in Blackrock Hospice, where his kindness landed. Yeah. And where you're giving it back now as well. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's uh, a message of just taking a deep breath and let's just wait and see. Yeah, exactly. And I know. do it with kindness to whoever yeah. and whenever we can, because yeah. there is so much tragedy out there at the moment and yeah. so much suffering. Exactly. I think that's a really good point um, to leave people with is that you know, you can, all of us, you know, I always talk about the power of one, um, not about the movie, but actually some days I think, gosh, I'm not going to solve the whole world's problems, but I could do something, one thing today and maybe yeah. help one other person and make a difference. And it does make you feel much better about yeah. your life and how you live it as well. Yeah, definitely. Just those three minutes of kindness spent with somebody else mm. can make a difference for a lot of people. Have a exactly. out. Yeah. Nora, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Liz. Stuff. Are you happy about that? <laughs>